clear of controversial social campaigns. Jennifer Westacott is the Chief Executive of the sector's peak body, the Business Council of Australia. She was an early and prominent supporter of marriage equality. Jennifer Westacott, welcome back to breakfast. Thanks, Fran. This week, Woolworths faced some kind of backlash from some customers after Roger, Roger Corbett, who did run the company for 10 years, doesn't anymore, I mean 10 years ago, sorry, told the 7.30 report this week that he would vote no. Before that, we've seen uh, Alan Joyce from Qantas face criticism and have a pie in his face for high-profile campaigning for a yes vote. What's your view? Should businesses get involved in these sort of social campaigns? Well, the first thing is, I don't think there's a division in the business community. People have got different views, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, look, I think the issue for business is, first of all, they employ millions of Australians. They, they stand very strongly for diverse workplaces. And some of them have very strong views that, that this is a kind of you know, a kind of symbol of kind of that diversity in the workplace. But I think it's not fair to say to business, we want, you know, it's okay to speak out about gender equality, about women in leadership. It's, it's okay to speak out about and support the arts. It's okay to kind of do things in the community, but it's not okay to talk about marriage equality. I don't think people can have it both ways. And I think businesses who employ so many people who are big parts of communities are entitled to take views on this and, and entitled to kind of have strong opinions either way, and providing you, it's respectful and informed. And is that are you supported in that view by your members at the BCA? The BCA in the past is not a very outspoken body generally on a, on a range of, of social issues, yeah. on some it is, yeah. like equity, yeah. uh, gender equity. Um, what was the tipping point for you in deciding that you would take a stand on this? Well, obviously I'm in a same-sex relationship. I have been for you know over 30 years. And to me, this whole debate and this, the, the decision for Australian people is one about respect, about acceptance, about legitimacy. I mean, I've spent my whole life feeling like an outsider. I've spent my whole life and, and the long relationship that I've been in, which has been a happy and loving relationship, feeling like it doesn't have the same legitimacy, the same respect, the same acceptance as other people's relationships. And to me, uh, you know, it's important for people like me to kind of come out and say, for me, that's the fundamental issue, that my life, that my relationship ought to be treated with that same level of respect. And given that personal investment, are you feeling that is being personally respected in this debate as we're hearing it? No, as no, I, no I don't. I think, I think uh, you know, there are both sides of this debate that have got, I think, uh, some things to answer for in terms of extreme views either way. But, you know, when I hear people talking about that children uh, are not uh, going to be uh, okay in same-sex relationships. I mean, I, I am deeply offended by that. I ran the Department of Community Services. I was the Deputy Director General. I ran the Department of Housing in Victoria. I was the Secretary of Education in Victoria. I actually know quite a lot about what's good for children. I can tell you this. Children are better with people who love them and respect them. And I saw some horrific examples of what happened to children in heterosexual relationships. You know, terrible abuse, neglect. Kids are well off when they are with people who love and respect them and as a society we should love and respect them so when I start hear people saying that I uh, and people like me are not capable of caring for children that is deeply hurtful deeply offensive and deeply wrong and so feelings are being hurt and it is deeply personal yeah. um, but there are strong feelings on the no campaign as well and and uh, we've had an, had an example this week of a of a young employee being sacked because she was outspoken with the no vote and her employer thought that was inappropriate and i think that's wrong you know i, I think this is but we have laws to deal with this yeah and we and, and this will be done when the don't with as i understand in the fair work, fair work commission i'm not on top of the of the detail of that but but clearly people are entitled to different views what I would like to see is that it's respectful and that it's informed. You're listening to Our Own Breakfast. Our guest is Jennifer Westacott. She's the CEO of the Business Council of Australia. Uh, Jennifer, on another issue, a former Prime Minister is now threatening to cross the floor if the Coalition legislates any kind of clean energy target. Earlier in the program, we heard from Ross Garner, who's the chair of Zen Energy, which has just inked this deal uh, with the new British owners of Arium Steel to provide solar and battery storage for the wireless steelworks. Um, clearly pushing ahead with a renewable solution there, regarding, regardless, I guess, of government policy in the future. Is this the way forward for business now, given well, this apparent paralysis within government, within our parliament, over the best way to proceed? It's a very important question. I mean, can I just say what's, what's really at stake here? What, why are we in this position? Uh, we're in this position for, because we've had a decade of terrible policy. We've had, you know, failed starts on a carbon pricing scheme. We've had a mismatch of poorly designed... Uh, green schemes and renewable schemes. We've had states putting moratoriums on gas supply that has really restricted gas. 
And now we've got capacity coming out of the system as these players age. And what I'd like us to do, friends, have a debate about now, what do we need to do to fix it? And it won't be one scheme, one project. We need a comprehensive scheme that says, a plan that says, okay, we've got to get security right, we've got to get reliability right, we've got to get affordability right, and we've got to get sustainability right. That is meeting the carbon target. So very briefly, security and reliability, I think Alan Finkel's review has largely fixed that with the rule changes in the medium term. Affordability and sustainability are complicated, and you need to deal with them together because there's things on the sustainability side that impact on affordability. But very briefly, what do we need to do? On affordability, we have to deal with capacity. We have got to stop capacity coming out unexpectedly. And that's what AGL has done. They have given early notice, as people like us suggested, of their intention to close. We've got to stop capacity constraints. You know, we've got coal not being supplied to some power stations. We have got to get gas supply happening. Um, it is the best transition fuel, and states have put these restrictions on it against the advice of their chief scientists. And we have got to stop making mistakes. Now, the Business Council, as you know, opposed the renewable energy target. Very strongly. You also oppose the carbon price. We, we oppose the design of the carbon price under the Gillard government. The Business Council had actually agreed to the CPRS, and that's a whole other interview. Um, but let's just go back to uh, capacity. If we were to get rid of the RET now, uh, it is the only investment coming into the system. And there is an expectation that it will have uh, a reduction on price. If we get rid of it, just out of the blue, that reduction is at risk. So on affordability, there's a suite of things we could do. On sustainability, meeting our carbon target, you know, we've got to remember that electricity shouldn't be doing all the heavy lifting. We should be looking at the vehicle standards, building standards. But here's the thing, Fran, and this is a really important point I want to make. What, if I answered you, what will be the carbon price in 2036? You, you can't answer that question for me. How will it be designed? We do not know how emissions are going to be treated in this economy, and that is the investment problem. I agree with Rod Sims yesterday. Investment's not the only problem, but it's a big problem. If we want affordability uh, to, to actually be solved, we have to have investment, we have to have capacity. And whilst ever companies cannot answer that question, not just about price, but whether their product will actually be viable, then we will not get that investment. And if we're going to do it through the taxpayer, well, then that's something else the taxpayer won't be able to do. Okay, Hospital so when Tony cheaper. Abbott says it would be unconscionable for a government that was originally elected promising to abolish the carbon tax, for that government to now go further down the renewable energy path, what do you think of that? Because as we mentioned, you didn't support the carbon tax, so you supported the coalition in scrapping it, and here we are. Well, well we, what we have to have is a set of policies that get you an energy mix that and what, is, that, is, that a, is that a clean energy target? Is that well, that's one way of doing it. I, I think part the of the problem the with this the debate, it's the, it's the one on the table at the moment, absolutely. But companies have to understand how emissions will be treated in the economy. And I agree that, that, that we should not have technology bias there. We should be designing whatever it is so that it's technology neutral and that it's capable of responding to new technologies that we don't even know about. But part of our problem here, Fran, is that the debate for years has been about acronyms, an ETS, an EIS, a CET, and, and, and if I said to people in the street, what do you think that means, most people would say, well, I don't know. We have to get back to a practical discussion about how do we fix affordability, how do we fix reliability and security, how do we meet our carbon target going forward, and the part of that that is not solved is how we will treat emissions going forward. And let's have that debate, uh, and let's have that debate in a non-technology biased way. Okay, just uh, as part of um, the reliability argument, what we're hearing at the moment is the Prime Minister pressuring uh, AGL to keep its ageing Liddell coal generation open, even accusing the company of abandoning the public interest in the pursuit of profits, essentially. Where does the BCA stand on that? Is the public interest paramount, or should AGL be allowed to run its assets as it seems Well, a couple of things there. We, we were the uh, organisation that suggested early notification of closure so that you could actually plan for mm. that to be replaced. Now, AGL has done that. Um, second, they have made it very clear what the cost of keeping that plant is. You know, 160 million a year uh, leading up to 2022. They have made it clear that it is unviable uh, beyond that. And you have to remember that only 1% of coal fired power stations stay open past this 50 year life that they have across the world. So, you know, their job is now to identify how they're going to replace that capacity. The government's job is to make sure there is enough capacity. Well, that's right. Uh, but, but, but I'll tell you something, Fran. When governments start telling companies uh, what projects they should invest in, how much they should spend on it, who, who they should employ, 
how much they should pay them, then they need to absolve directors of liabilities and they need to turn up to the AGM. Well, just on that, because there is quite a bit of intervention going on from the government at the moment in some other businesses as well. We've got the, the government looking to get gas exporters to keep some of their gas here rather than ship it overseas. The government's introduced a new accountability regime for banks that could force top executives to be registered with the regulator. Uh, what do you think of these moves? Are you surprised it's a Conservative government doing this? Well, I think everyone's surprised it's, it's a Conservative government doing it. I mean, you know, people forget that, that, you know, our business community has been a very strong one. We have not seen the sorts of things that we've seen in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, and as I said, you know, directors have liabilities. Once governments start blurring that, accountability starts to blur. But let me just go to the gas uh, market issue. This sits, the government has had to do this, to be fair, because state governments, who have been happy to take the royalties, happy to use the gas, have, have acted against often the advice of their chief scientists and restricted supply. What is important now for government on this gas issue, on this market issue, is to sit down with business and make sure that we are not doing something that is going to actually give unintended consequences, reduce investment uh, and, and distort the market in a very, very unhelpful way. But this is about cooperation. This is about working together rather than blaming each other. We need a cooperative approach and frankly the states have to be at the table because they're half of the problem. Jennifer Westacott, we're supposed to be talking uh, uh, business tax cuts as well, but we're out of time. We'll have to come back for another review on that, I think. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Jennifer Westacott is the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia. You're listening to RM Breakfast. It's 11 minutes to 8.